We hebben een mooie volle zaal. Um, I'm going to switch to English. Because, um, well, Shannon is US. Thanks. They talk kind of English. <laughs> kind of English. What? I said, it's kind of English. Stupefied English? Oh. oh. <laughs> Sorry. Oh. Okay, I'll this, try to slip in some big words. This, this was a joke uh, <laughs> to, <laughs> to warm you up. Um, well, uh, <laughs> oh, that's the other joke, yeah. She, she doesn't know where Oslo is. So that's, that, that's the connection to the next speaker, Per. So, yeah. But do you know where it's Temecula is? Where? Exactly. Now, which place? <laughs> Temecula. Anyone? It's in, Temecula? It's in the US, right? <laughs> <laughs> it's not. Might as well be. Okay. Um, well, about a year ago, we, uh, we, we thought us, uh, to ourselves, well, uh, we want to know something about web ac acceleration. is actually your thing. Yeah. Um, so uh, that's why uh, we um, um, tried to win to to invite uh, Nginx and uh, well they uh, gave us Sharon Shannon <laughs> and uh, well which is also uh, the int introduction to the next uh, speaker but uh, I'll uh, leave to that one uh, Shannon <laughs> <she> was... <laughs> hi everyone <laughs> um, thank you for that uh, Yes, I will, I will try to um, follow that up. Uh, so <laughs> thank you all for coming. Um, a note before we begin. Uh, I have no idea if this actually got translated properly because I don't speak any Dutch and I put that into Google Translate. Did it come out offensive? Okay. have to learn more actual spoken languages instead of computer languages. Um, great. So um, please forgive me because I did not know a whole lot about uh, you guys before writing this talk. So um, it may be a, a little too high level. If you want to get deeper in, into some of the technical stuff, uh, please ask questions during the presentation um, and, and we'll work on getting those answered. Uh, so a little bit about me. Um, I am a developer advocate for Nginx. Uh, how many of you uh, use Nginx? Great. Um, so before I started working as a developer advocate, um, I was a full stack engineer. Um, so I built everything from API endpoints to client interactions um, using Ruby on Rails for the API side and Ember.js on the front end. Um, and then I missed humans, so I wanted to go into something where I could talk to computers and humans. Uh, and so here I am working for Nginx. And it has been a really big learning experience going from a feature builder, uh, throwing things over the wall and hoping that it got on the internet somehow, to learning about how web servers actually work. Um, and uh, part of what I do is travel a lot. Uh, I came here a little bit early, a few days early, and decided to work out of one of the local cafes uh, and had some issues with internet connections. Is the Wi-Fi bad everywhere here, or was I just really unlucky? That's, okay. Um, <laughs> uh, Europe, right, the whole, oh, oh yeah, I was in the wrong country. Um, <laughs> so this was me being very frustrated at my computer uh, at the Wi-Fi in a cafe down the street. Um, and it got me thinking how frustrated I was about how internet, the internet has become so ingrained in all of our lives and how we as users have become so impatient. Um, we want more from the internet. Uh, we want it better and bigger and we want it now. Um, and hopefully we can avoid this. Uh, so, this, I know, isn't this a glorious web page? This is actually still live on the internet right now. You can go to this website and somebody's actually expecting people to visit it. Um, <laughs> yeah, yeah, did you see that? <laughs> I know. 
I know. I, I, I was kind of shocked. Um, so I wanted to remind you guys uh, the early days, the internet, and how far we've come. Um, this is a website that just won an award um, for design and uh, user interaction. And the difference between these two really shows me how drastic the um, demands have changed from users. Uh, we want more of an intuitive experience. We want feature-rich experiences that are reliably available and as close to instantaneously um, available as possible. Um, and it, it got me thinking in that cafe. Uh, I, I love analogies. And so I started to think of, of the internet as a volcano. Um, and just like a volcano can lay dormant for a long time, um, a lot of pressure from users and developers alike has built up since HTTP version 1.1 was released in 1997. And the web has changed a whole lot since then. Um, and part of the newest eruption of tech has been HTTP2. Uh, and Nginx, the web server that prides itself on being the heart of the modern web, is really trying to adapt to that new landscape as quickly as possible. So in this talk, I'm going to touch on three ways that Nginx is changing to try to meet these demands. Uh, the first thing I'll touch on is how um, Nginx is extending the capabilities of the web server that you know and love uh, with a new thing called EngineScript. Has anybody heard of EngineScript yet? One person. Yes. Okay. Excited that you're not going to know everything I'm going to say. Uh, and then we will go on to talk about how Nginx supports a microservices architecture. Is anybody using microservices? Oh, less than, okay, less than I thought. Okay, but everybody's heard of microservices. No, even better. Okay, yes, yes. Um, and then we'll finally close with going over um, how Nginx can help you adapt to the changes that are being brought by HTTP2. Um, so essentially, I want to let you walk away with something about HTTP2 that you can do now. Um, so how many of you have never configured an Nginx server yourself? OK. Oh, great. OK, well then I will go through a quick little review of some of the basics of Nginx configuration. Um, for those of you that know, uh, just bear with me. So this is part of the Nginx configuration file. Uh, so when you install Nginx, this is the, the brains of the heart of the modern web. Uh, everything in here is what's going to run your entire server. And it's really just comprised of three separate things, which really boil down to one thing, which is a directive. Um, this one here, simple directive, um, access log, you're just telling it what you want uh, and where to put it. The next is a block directive, which is essentially a block of simple directives. And then the third is a context, uh, context block, uh, which is a block of block directives. So that one, given a server context, I want you to listen on this port. Uh, and then when you hit the location slash, take that with you and look there. That's essentially what it says. So does everyone feel comfortable now with Nginx a little bit? Really basic. Now you can all do everything in Nginx. Um, I will send out the slides if you want to play with them. Um, does this translate at all? Do you guys have the phrase, oh, teach an old dog new tricks? OK. Winning. Awesome. OK, so first I wanted to talk about um, engine script uh, and how to extend the functionality of your web server uh, with this new tool that we've developed and just recently launched. Uh, but before we jump into that, I wanted to talk about this. Uh, what do you guys think of this? Is this a bad thing or a good thing? Depends. That is the best answer. OK. So um, what do you think of code injection? 
grown up. Okay. Um, for a long time, people have wanted to make changes to their applications without having to alter their application code. And sometimes it's for evil reasons, but not always. It's a tool, just like a needle. Um, and with needles, you need to find the right place to inject uh, to make those changes. And Nginx ends up being one of the most optimal places to do that. It's the bump in the wire. Uh, so that is what spawned EngineScript. EngineScript, if you don't know what it is at all, is a JavaScript implementation for your web server, which means that you can write JavaScript code, little snippets, that get compiled and run at content generation. Uh, so, in, and that's internally, natively, in Nginx. Uh, so essentially, EngineScript is comprised of two parts. One is the JavaScript-like syntax. It's not a fully uh, ECMAScript um, compliant. Uh, it's not all of JavaScript, because we wanted to release it early so we could develop the features that you wanted. Uh, and then also, we didn't want to have some of the more esoteric parts of JavaScript slowing it down or giving you access to things that end up being dangerous. Um, and then the other part is that it's a custom runtime. Uh, so instead of, when we first released this, a lot of the questions from the community were, why would I use this, And which I'll go over, and um, why would you reinvent the wheel and write your own JavaScript engine? Uh, and the reason we did that is because the runtimes that existed are optimized for the browser. And we wanted to optimize for the server. We have always pride, prided ourselves on having a product that is lightweight, fast, reliable. And the only way to do that with JavaScript in natively in Nginx was to create our own runtime. Uh, so that's why we did that. Uh, Part of it is that uh, the JavaScript runtime in Nginx is very disposable and lightweight. So every time you need to compile a snippet, it will spin up a new VM and then destroy it as soon as that snippet completes. And then we're also working right now on creating it uh, and making a feature that is preemptive. So when Engine Script, um, when a snippet runs in Engine Script uh, and it performs a blocking operation, Nginx will suspend the execution of that VM until, um, until it completes, and then it will reschedule it when it completes. So I mentioned that the biggest question was, that why, would, why would you ever want this? Then other than me just telling you to use it, because um, everybody knows that works, I'm going to go over some real-world examples of what you could use it for. And the first is when everything breaks. Uh, it becomes a great band-aid, a good start. It's not going to be what you need to use to fix things uh, forever, but it is a really great place to start. Say that you've got um, an airline site and you're looking up, uh, one of your users comes across a bug where you're searching for flights and it, every time you search for a flight with 100 connections, the entire application crashes. Uh, and it may take a long time for your developers to hunt down that bug and to fix it. So in the meantime, you can inject a snippet of JavaScript in through Nginx. And um, don't you know, stop anyone from making any requests for connections that are over three connections. Uh, buy some time for your developers so that they can then find and fix the bug. Another use case would be to control the traffic in a more intelligent way. So let's say um, Justin Bieber retweets your application somewhere, and now you're getting flooded with all of this traffic from Twitter that's not really helpful to you. And it's slowing down your application for other users that are more valuable. What you can do is add a cookie dynamically to all of the um, traffic that's getting referred from a certain source, and then dynamically um, apply rate limiting to those uh, referrers. Uh, the last reason it could be used for possible use case in the future uh, that I find most exciting, actually, is to use it um, to uh, extend your application and then also use it within a microservices framework uh, alongside or, sorry, aspect-oriented programming. So within a microservices, I'll go into microservices a little bit more in detail for those of you who are not familiar with it too much. 
Um, but if you've got an application that's broken up into a bunch of different services, and you have one service that all your other services are reliant on, uh, it may make more sense to pull that service out and put it in your server level, kind of like a hive mind. Um, that's a possible future use case, though. It's not been tested yet, and um, I'm looking forward to playing with some code and seeing how that works. Uh, so I've got a few slides in here on how to actually use it. These are the, the uh, directives for engine scripts. It's very simple, actually. Uh, you just set variables, JavaScript variables, using JS set, uh, and that's within your configuration file. Then you can use those variables with any other Nginx directive. Uh, you can also run a snippet of JavaScript using JS run, and again, that will be um, evaluated at content generation or when the variable gets set. You also have access to this thing called the request object within Engine, Nginx. Uh, it's this dollar sign $R thing. And it allows you to access and modify the requests that come in through your server. So you can add cookies, change the request in some way, and all of that dynamically based off of that little snippet that you inject. It also has a response object on, on the uh, request object as well. So uh, you can generate a response using a JavaScript variable um, and, uh, and create your own custom response. It can be really helpful for um, creating better error messages. Here's a little slide on how to install it. Uh, you can find exactly this at the documentation, which I've linked to. Uh, just a couple things to note. It's in a very beta stage. It's experimental right now. And we released it early because we really want to develop something that you'll use and that you find useful. So we've, we've launched it in hopes that you'll play with it. You'll find the limitations. You'll find the pain points. Let us know. Let me know. I am actually your advocate, so I want to know these things so that I can then take that information directly to Igor Sosoyev, who creator of Nginx. He's the one that's actually building this right now, um, and tell him how to direct the development of it. Uh, so because of that, you have to download the most up-to-date version from Nginx directly. Uh, using apt-get install will not work. It's going to be a very out-of-date version. Uh, and then you need to clone the, uh, the Mercurial repository that has uh, engine script in it. Uh, and from there, you just make it, install it, and you should be able to go from there. So um, going back to microservices. Sorry, there were a couple of people that were using microservices now and a couple of people that didn't know about microservices at all. So I'm just going to go a little bit over what microservices are. Um, did anybody watch Power Rangers as a kid? Yeah. Do you remember when all the Power Rangers like transformed and then became this giant monster? That's microservices, right? Yay! You're like, what are you saying? I don't understand. <laughs> it's OK. Um, I like analogies. Sometimes they work, and sometimes they don't. Uh, so monolithic architecture is very common. Uh, it's where you have all of your business, uh, your business requirements inside one single application. Uh, and then each side of your monolith is an adapter to an API that you may be using, your database, uh, your client, um, all of that. So uh, microservices, so the idea behind the move from a monolithic to a microservices architecture is that monoliths can get bloated. Um, the other a analogy I use is a, is a little baby um, gazelle. You've, you've birthed this little baby app, and you're so proud of it, and you love it. And people are starting to pay attention, so you keep feeding it some code. You're like, yeah, I want you to grow bigger and get more features and be big and strong. And you keep feeding it, people are loving it making it more and more popular, and then all of a sudden you turn around and your gazelle is totally obese, it's giant, doesn't even know how to walk down the street, let alone gallop, you know, enjoyably. And, uh, and it's so big that you can't possibly hold all of that information in one developer's head. So debugging became really difficult. It's um, difficult to scale at that point. 
um, just a whole sort of problems. So microservices is the idea of um, taking out all of the individual business requirements and putting them into individual services that then agree on very strict communication guidelines, usually an API, um, to talk to each other. So um, one more analogy before I move on, the volcano analogy, going back to it. A lot of people talk about microservices as a recycling of service-oriented architecture. Um, and I'm just going to say that uh, I don't, I'm not qualified enough to say whether that's correct or not, um, but I think that it's irrelevant. Uh, that tech is always uh, innovating and changing, and part of that is recycling old things, uh, letting them melt down, and then erupting them back into the world. And it's something that's happening, and we need to adapt to it. So how does Nginx support microservices? The cool thing about Nginx is that it can do a lot of different things. It's not just a web server. You can use it as an API gateway. You can use it as a web server. You can use it to cache things. You can use it as a proxy. And you can use it on so many different parts of your application. And it's something that a lot of people already know, so you can keep it consistent. It's also something that you can use to ease the transition from a monolithic architecture to a microservices architecture. You can put it in front and start to slowly break apart your monolith. And if you want to know more about microservices, we are sponsoring the book on it uh, by O'Reilly. And I've got this little code here, so if you want to download it for free, it's there, or come find me. I will tweet the link out so that you can have the microservices book um, if you follow me on Twitter. Uh, or if you bug me in person, that's cool too. And the last thing I'll touch on is adapting to HTTP2. So for those of you who are not already aware of HTTP2, how many is that? Everybody's like, I already know everything about it. No? Sweet. OK. Um, you're all using it already, so you should probably know about it. <laughs> uh, HTTP2 is, is simply an extension of Speedy, the Speedy protocol. Is anyone familiar with that? Oh, a few people? OK. So it's pioneered by Google. Um, some of the changes that, the, that come with HTTP2 change the patterns that we used before for performance in um, HTTP 1.1. Uh, so it's important to be aware of that. Uh, so I had a, a nice fun demo to show you, but my computer broke in Denver a couple of days ago, so I had to rewrite everything. Um, so I have this kind of screenshot of a demo. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, but this is actually a server. It's a picture of a server that I had actually running at one point. Um, and it's an Nginx server running both HTTP2 and HTTPS at the same time with the same picture. And you can see the performance difference. Ooh. Ah, excitement. It really helps uh, improve performance on mobile as well. And the way that those performance enhancements happen, um, if you look into the protocol, is sorry. <laughs> oh, yeah, I forgot I put a funny thing in there. Um, <laughs> oh, I'm a dork. Uh, is, uh, so HTTP2 is binary versus um, textual. Uh, so they also have um, compressed headers. So because your headers are now compressed into binary, um, if you're using Telnet to debug your headers, you no longer will be able to. So be aware of that until some other tool gets developed. Um, if anyone knows of a tool, please let me know. I'd love to add it to my deck. I'd also love to play with it. Uh, the other thing is that um, it's fully multiplexed. Um, so it, it has one connection with parallelism in it. And that's very related to this slide. Um, it uses encryption everywhere. And because it's multiplexed, it actually lowers the amount of handshakes that you need to do. Uh, so the performance is enhanced rather than slowed down. And um, when I originally wrote this talk, I had a bunch of slides with really fun pictures of a cat on a pizza in space. Um, <laughs> and I took it out uh, because originally my thought was, why do I need to encrypt? Why do I need to pay money for a certificate to encrypt 
all of the cat pictures on the internet. It seemed really bizarre to me until I went to a conference in London and I saw this guy. This is Daniel Applequist. He is one of the chairs of the WC3 schools. And um, he said this in his talk. It's not a tinfoil hat. You can get tortured and you can get killed for what you like on the internet. And it really resonated with me. So I had to change my slides and make that point because um, I think it's really powerful. Uh, but this is a talk about Nginx. So how do you get your Nginx server ready for HTTP2? It turns out it's actually pretty simple. So um, the only things that you really need to do are make sure that you're using the most up-to-date version of Nginx. And then when you build your Nginx server, compile it with the um, HTTP2 module. And then you can just use it in a server block. Um, I also want to note that it is still in its experimental phase. So test it out, and your mileage may vary. But please, again, let me know your feedback on it, and let me be your advocate. No questions. No, it's OK. I'm just kidding. Sorry. Yeah. Um, so how do you HTTP? I mean, HTTP 2, a lot of the gain is it with priorities and push lists. Uh, do you know how uh, your application would signal to Nginx that it would re require something in to have a certain priority or to set up push lists? Because it's these dynamic aspects of HTTP2. I, I know I'm if I'm being a pain in the no, ass. No, 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 yes. no. This is good. <laughs> so um, you were talking about the so part of HTTP2 is that you can it can now you can proactively push from your server, right? Yes. Okay. And you're wondering how, because there's a, like in, weird rules about it in, that you yeah, can, a yeah. lot of configuration you can do in HTTP2 that you couldn't do before. Absolutely. Um, and that, that those aspects of the configuration are dynamic, so it's kind of a hard. Yeah. Um, so I was in the room listening to the developers have uh, the core developer for Nginx talk about that and um, complain, because they're wonderful and I love listening to them complain. And I don't remember what the resolution is. So let me get back to you <laughs> <Okay>. on that. <laughs> but I will find out. I'm not afraid to say I don't know. <laughs> you had a small question about you showed one slide where you compared HTTPS to HTTP2. And then I saw the SSL HTTP2 on the last slide. So I was wondering, like, is HTTP2, is it default encrypted? or? Yes. Okay. I knew that one. Any other questions? Comments? OK. Requests? OK, moving on. Uh, this is a fun picture. Yay! Uh, everybody loves rainbows until you run into one. So I just wanted to give you a couple of warnings to, to watch out for when you do change, make the change. Um, some of the things that we did before uh, to optimize performance in version 1.1 um, can actually decrease your performance gains in HTTP2. Uh, domain sharding, data concatenation, inlining, and image spriting. Uh, so if you are using HTTP2 already and you're using any of those things and you're not seeing the performance gains that you would have expected, check those out, try removing them or altering them and see if that impacts the performance gains that you'll see. Uh, the CDN I wanted to make a note of. Uh, it's not that a, having a CDN will hurt your performance with HTTP2, but you might not have as much helpfulness with HTTP2 as you did with version 1.1. Um, so just monitor it to see if you're really getting the performance gains that you were getting before. Um, but once you fix those things and you change those patterns, you should see a significant boost in performance. Um, so just to wrap up, we talked about how to extend your web server with Engine Script. We explored how Nginx supports a microservices architecture. And finally, we adapted to the changes brought to HTTP, brought to us by HTTP2. Uh, so Thank you for letting me drone on at you in English.
Uh, oh, I didn't slip in some big words. <sighs> How sesquipedalian of me. Um, okay, uh, but if you do have any questions, it's okay to ask me hard ones. I just like funny pictures. Let me know. I'm always looking for ways to improve. I'm fairly new to this world coming from the feature side. So please, if you notice anything that needs correction or if you have ideas or feature requests or feedback, send me an email, follow me on Twitter, let me know, bother me in person. I won't bite you or anything. Are there any questions, especially anything related to this topic? <laughs> Are there any plans for supporting uh, different languages inside Nginx? Different apart, languages other than JavaScript. For, yeah. Right now, so there is a community module that you can use called Lua. Um, but right now it's, it's limited to, so Lua has a lot more support, community support, because it's been around longer. Uh, Nginscript is still just in development, but right now there's no plans to add other languages. But I don't know what will happen in the future. OK, OK, yeah, thank you. Do you have any requests on languages that you'd like to see? Um, it's written in C. So. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and C module can also be written, of course. Oh, the whole thing is written in C. Yeah, of course, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I want Python, personally. Python. Yeah? Ooh, Python, OK. Sorry, any other questions? I saw one over here. So I want to have you repeat it just for the recording. OK, how do you prevent uh, Nginx from becoming the next Apache with all the feature uh, adding? Uh... That's a great question. <laughs> um, so to answer that, I want to know more about what it is about Apache that you really don't like. Are you worried that there's just it's too bloated? Well, I've seen it grow uh, it, from Apache-like yeah. uh, to what's it, what it's now. Uh, so it's. Is, and, and that's uh, exactly the niche where Nginx uh, yes. fit it in. Huh? Yes. Um, so the feature extensions that we have, you don't have to use. You don't have to build it with Engine, Engine Script. You don't ever have to use Engine Script if you don't want to. Uh, so you can just keep the small, lightweight Nginx that you know and love. Is that cool? Any other questions? If you guys don't ask more questions, I will ask questions of you. No, they will be, they'll be embarrassing questions. I have a question. Okay, perfect. Do you know something called uh, strobe wavels? <laughs> what? <laughs> oh, wait, I'm going to go back to that one slide that says what? It's too far back. Oh, no. What? <laughs> Too much build up for that one. What, okay. what, what, what is uh, this? Th this is a uh, typical uh, Dutch cookie. And you just said you love cookies. And Thank another you. little present. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for being here. And we have enough time 